The next speaker is Ulrich Schachtler, um, Automated Data Modeling for Science via Bayesian Probabilistic Program Synthesis. Hi. Um, yes. I am Ulrich Schachtler. I'm a postdoc in uh, the Kashman Senkas group uh, with the MIT Probabilistic Computing Project. And my talk is indeed about automated data modeling for science applications via probabilistic program synthesis. I will start, or the, the talk is structured as follows. I will start by basically setting the stage. What is the problem and well, how are we trying to solve it? Um, I will then explain in depth how uh, synthesis works on the real examples that we get from a collaborator uh, in synthetic biology. Um, and I will conclude with other use cases in future research. So here's the setting we're in. We're working with domain experts who work in lab environments, wet lab environments, who produce data. And because we all like realistic programming, from my personal point of view, what we really want is to uh, model the generative process that generates the data that comes out of the lab experiment. So what we want is a virtual experiment simulator um, as a probabilistic program. If you had that simulator, you could do a number of interesting things that could help accelerate science. Um, one problem that we encounter in our collaborations is that uh, uh, practitioners in wet labs really want this capability of screening new batches of data uh, for ETL errors and lab protocol execution errors. Um, they also need, have a need for detecting drift between old and new batches of data. Um, in terms of the more theoretical questions, they want to uh, detect multivariate relationships among variables and also quantify those relationships somehow. And finally, what we hear again and again is that the practitioners want to get an idea of how reliable their experiment is and what the anticipated variability of an outcome for a given experimental condition should be. Now, Writing probabilistic programs is actually hard. Um, we are, most of the times we're not in a situation where we have a person who is a domain expert in, uh, in science or in synthetic biology um, that has both knowledge about synthetic biology and is able to write uh, probabilistic programs in a recent language. But it turns out that relevant data is often available. Um, it could be that the data is available through previous studies um, or the, the papers that people read before they set up the new experiment, or, and we see this happens all the time, the practitioners, the domain expert, go to the wet lab and collect data before they actually have thought through the probabilistic program that models the underlying data generative process best. And the question that I try to address is, uh, can we actually automatically build those probabilistic programs uh, from the data that is available? And our approach to do this is automated data modeling via Bayesian probabilistic program synthesis. So how does that work? We start with a sparse database, um, and together with some assumptions, qualitative uh, constraints and quantitative assumptions, um, we feed the data into our synthesizer. The synthesizer spits out uh, probabilistic programs, uh, ensembles of probabilistic programs that model the data generative process. Um, and sort of the novel thing that I'm presenting here is that um, not only we can do the synthesis, but also those probabilistic programs are actual programs that run in a brand new probabilistic programming system that came out of our lab called Metaprop. Um, and they can be executed, they uh, are traced, and uh, a practitioner can post queries to that program and get relevant answers out of it. The technical challenge here is that uh, Program synthesis is closely related to model structure learning, and structure learning is hard. Um, for example, with Bayesian networks, like if you uh, look at the research of the past years, and you tried it in, in, in practical scenarios, you realize search over structure is oftentimes slow and reliable. It's hard to include hidden variables, which often leads to underfitting. Um, it's hard to apply mixed numerical and discrete data settings and um, getting uncertainty over model structure is also very difficult. The good news is, though, we can use tools from non-parametric base to um, address these problems. So in the lab, we have 
some 10 years of research experience and engineering towards a non-parametric prior over probabilistic model structure. Um, and we also build on previous implementations um, of, of Monte Carlo inference that scales this to larger data sets. Um, and this talk is not about the math behind this prior or the inference. It's more about the, uh, the, the practical implications of us being able to do that. So I invite you to either find the domain experts that we're doing, uh, what we're, that we're developing the inference, or go and read the papers um, if you have questions about that part. Um, I'm much more interested in actually making this practical, and therefore I would like to walk you through an example from synthetic biology. So what we see here is a data set from uh, uh, a collaborator of ours on uh, genetic circuit design. So the idea is that you can basically engineer genes in a certain way so that an observable output, which we call actuator, um, which is a gene that uh, uh, generates yellow fluorescent protein, YFP, um, is either on or off. Uh, has either high output and high read counts or low read counts. So the data we see here is RNA-seq data, and there are a few variables related to experimental conditions. There is the circuit output, there's genes that are parts of the circuit, and other genes that are sequenced in the process of getting this data that have nothing to do with our engineered circuits. And in this case, we have some roughly 320 measurements. And what we want is really a virtual experiment simulator for this data. And before I go into detail of how it actually works, just to see what comes out of it is that we can, or we've shown that we can reliably simulate data uh, for the data generative process that has produced the data table that I just shown. And you can see it on the left, you have this funny regime for the two most important variables in this data set um, that are clearly, you know, you can't model this with a linear equation, which is oftentimes the tool of choice for, 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 for the practitioners, unfortunately. Um, instead, um, we can simulate data from, 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 from our synthesized programs and compare them with uh, uh, the actual RNA-seq data. Now, how does this work? Um, and the cool thing is the synthesis in our languages, we can actually write a synthesis program in only uh, 20 lines of code. So for this demo, we only took uh, four of the, of the columns in the data set that I just showed, mainly so that I can get the results onto a slide and walk you through the entire synthesized <coughs> program. Um, we do choose uh, the output of the circuit, a part of the circuit, and two unrelated uh, uh, genes. So the output is called actuator YFP, uh, the part is RiboJ00 part ribozyme, and we have YBIT and CYSM. In the next step of the synthesis process, we uh, define a statistical population for this data. So that basically means we tell the synthesizer uh, how to model, how to treat the columns in the data table. In this case, we model them all as numerical variables. Um, and this is inference, basically. What we do here is, um, we initialize the prior um, and an ensemble of 100 models um, to basically run 100 independent uh, uh, MCMC chains um, to do analysis on, on this data. I tend to use the word ensemble when I talk to practitioners because the MCMC uh, construct is not necessarily known to them. Um, and finally, we can take what uh, the synthesizer learned and export this to uh, models in our new programming language called Metaprof. And this is the result of the synthesis program running on the data as I described it. We have an executable uh, 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 function, executable code in the Metaprof programming language, which is human readable. So I will walk you through and prove that what I'm saying is actually true. Um, and um, it's also editable. So if you imagine a, dom a domain expert not being uh, convinced but what the synthesizer generated, they can edit and change it as they wish. So I mentioned before that our code generated an ensemble of models. I will only show one of those because that makes the point. So we only look on, on one of the synthesized programs out of 100. And what the model learned is actually a hierarchical, hierarchical uh, uh, DP mixture model. Um, so what we're synthesizing here are a number of uh, Gaussian mixture models. And uh, to do that, what we first do is we um, 
a sample a cluster assignment for two variables that the model identified, uh, the synthesizer identified as dependent. Um, so what this line does is it gets you a cluster ID for uh, a new data point for YFP and RIBO um, to be drawn from a mixture with three components as it's like we sample from a three value categorical. Um, next, we take this cluster ID and uh, uh, define which uh, uh, parameters for the Gaussian mixture, uh, five minutes, okay. Um, I'll speed up. Um, and we define which um, parameters we, 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 we need to sample a new value from a Gaussian, which happens here. I said before that RIBO and, and YFP are actually dependent, so we take the same cluster ID and repeat the process. Um, but also the two other genes that are not part of the genetic circuit that is designed in this experimental data set, they are drawn from a different mixture model. So we have to draw a new cluster ID. And you can see that now we draw a cluster ID from a mixture model with six components, not three anymore. Um, we repeat the process, and what we get out is a, um, is a new row of the data table of the four uh, model columns. Um, so we have a virtual experiment result by forward executing this program. Now this program is, you cannot only be forward executed, but it's completely traced. So to, in order for us to do additional inference if we wanted to in future. So all the random choices made in this program, meaning not only the output of the programs are recorded in an address trace space. We call the function on top to generate a new data point on the right. Um, and um, here I'm just highlighting the four random choices that correspond to the output and we're not highlighting the cluster IDs that were sampled. We can repeat this process, and we have a number of data points. Um, here, we, we query the data points with the query engine, um, but you could imagine also this be just be run by uh, uh, running the, the, the function uh, a whole number of times. And um, <coughs> here's one uh, example here that we, where we used the synthesized programs to um, basically cross-check intuitions of the data. So in this data set, we would expect an interaction between the, the, the part of the, ge the, the genetic circuit and the output, um, and we also expect an inter interaction for YBIT and CYSM. Um, we wouldn't check an interaction uh, uh, for uh, the output and a, part of, uh, and a gene that is not part of the circuit. Um, to talk a little bit about other use cases in future research, um, we run this on a data set uh, coming out of child psychology, where we try to uh, screen for uh, identifiers for symptoms of suicide, um, also, and, and benchmarked it, or started the benchmarking process, I should say, uh, comparing it to other methods, trying to find identifiers by, again, analyzing the information flow of the uh, synthesized programs. Um, we also use this in another science application um, where we try to help uh, collaborators who are interested in protein folding uh, basically, that's a prediction tax, and they ask us, okay, here's a training data set, um, learn something from that, and then we give you a new data set where we don't have the labels. That means we don't know whether a protein stably folds or not, uh, and give us some predictions. And by using the, the synthesized models, it turned out for us that our model thinks that most of the proteins that they gave us in the new experiment uh, uh, are either uh, pretty certainly unstable, um, or there's really high uncertainty if they're actually stable. And it turned out that the problem was due to a data set drift. So that was a case where a, a, uh, the person who curated the data had new ideas about what should be measured next, which didn't really connect to the training data set. And we plotted an example of this in the middle, but that was a high dimensional data set. So like, you can't just go and inspect all the, uh, all the pair plots and all the interactions. So what we did is we used the synthesizer to actually compute KL divergence on all the predictive features um, between uh, 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 the training data set and the, and, and, and the test data set, basically. Future research that we'd like to work on, and we really uh, would appreciate any input for that, is incorporating qualitative constraints, that is, learning structure, for example, learning structure, but ensure A given B is informative of C, um, and D is independent of E. We would like to uh, analyze programs to detect causal structures. So if you have input for that, that's great. Uh, the metaprop language has very neat intervention semantics. Um, and another thing that we've been working on is uh, extending this synthesis process 
uh, to time series applications. Thank you very much. question on uh, types of data yeah. that this works really well on and types of data that you're planning for the future. That's kind of one question. And then the second connected question is on the programs that are generated, are there any quick and easy ways to, to know whether the program is kind of hallucinating or if it's in some way grounded? Uh, so to answer the first question. Um, Can you repeat the question? Yes. Please? Okay. So the first question about what data types we support because we've seen that I told the synthesizer that all our, our variables are numerical in this case. Um, I mean, there's a twofold answer to the question. We have tested categorical data and numerical data. Um, we do have uh, other data types available um, um, that a grad student in our lab for us was working on. Um, that involves counts, and I will start test the counts because that are those data type types. Uh, are really important for our collaborators, especially when you're talking about RNA-seq. Um, there, there are magnitudes available in that backend. Uh, one of the backend uh, engines for, for inference that we use supports a vast range of, of data types. I haven't l yet looked into supporting those, but that's an exciting direction. Um, the, second question, the second question was cross-checking the results. So what we do is, the easiest thing to see in those models is actually which variables are treated dependent and independent. And the, mo the first thing I do if I work with a collaborator is I, I, I look at the dependencies and tell them, do you expect this? Or is this, is this bogus or surprising? And, and if they say, okay, most of it is expected, a few of them are interesting, then I know, okay, that there was something reasonable that, that went on. The other thing that we did um, in the synthetic biology example is cross-check the variants, uh, the, the, the standard deviations that were learned. Because they were really high. So when I first showed this to the domain expert, they said, well, wh why are the standard deviations so high? And so I, I went on in my presentation, I was like, look, that's the comparison to the actual data, those standard deviations are sort of adequate. Um, so maybe there's a process, there's a bug in your data generating process. So those are the kind of cross checks that we run. Okay, time for one more question. Over there. Yeah, have you, um, have you done any research to sort of try to understand what sort of like characteristics or quality of experimental <laughs> data might be needed? Uh, Can you repeat the question? The question was whether we have studied what kind of uh, qualities or experimental conditions or how the experiment should be run. Is that the question? Or of the experimental data that you're using. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we use this for the data set drift uh, 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 use cases. So we don't want a, a great drift if, we, if, if the aim of the, if the, aim of the, the, the approach is a, a prediction task. Another thing that we did is we built sort of like a, a sort of like quick check, like a, a test on data where we just synthesize models for a new data set coming in. And if all the experimental conditions are independent of the experimental outcome and we throw, throw an error. Um, we also work on sort of like telling the scientist or autom and automating the process of telling the scientist what experiment to run next, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little bit of a harder problem and which experimental conditions you actually want to measure next. Because, but that, that gets harder for a number of reasons, uh, partially because the objective is not always clear. Do you want to minimize money? What, what, what if, or, I mean, you can't just up, you know, maximize information. It's yeah. not, not that easy. Okay, thank you very much.